as they professed that they were. Meanwhile, in Cuba, the people could re rely on good health care. They could rely upon having enough food to eat and have work to do. But on the other hand, there were shortages everywhere and lines for just about everything. The 1960s crash industrialization and diversification, and especially the moral rewards, which were the, which were the working of Che Guevara, were unsuccessful. Fidel Castro, recognizing that the Cuban economy was languishing and that the people were increasingly unhappy, turned back towards Cuba's old source of economic growth, the production of sugar. And Fidel Castro promised a 10 million ton sugar harvest in 1970. Things were getting worse and worse, however, and they never did produce that 10 million ton sugar harvest, only managing to achieve about 8.5 million tons. Castro, dispirited by the lack of economic growth in Cuba, offered his re resignation in 1970, but it was refused. Perhaps, economically, Cuba was in trouble, but ideologically, Castro had been victorious. Castro held on to power, the people continued to support him, and Castro continued to encourage people who disagreed with his regime or dissidents to leave. For instance, the Mariel boat lift of 1980 was a, resulted in 100,000 Cuban political dissidents being removed from Cuba to Florida. These were people who were unhappy with the Castro regime, and they were allowed to leave. Now, when they were left, when they left Cuba, uh, Castro also opened up the prisons and put some of the prisoners who were held in Cuban prisons, many of them violent criminals, on board this Mariel boat lift as well. So it was not only political dissidents, but also some violent criminals who were being removed from Cuba and allowed and encouraged to go to Florida. Right? This is the basis of the uh, Martin Scorsese movie um, Scarface, where Al Pacino plays a Cuban, a Cuban refugee who is um, removed from Cuba, um, but had actually been a prisoner and then becomes a very violent criminal in the United States. A great movie where Al Pacino actually does a dreadful uh, Cuban accent. Nevertheless, very enjoyable if you've never seen it. And by the way, as long as we're talking about Hollywood depictions of the um, Cuban Revolution, Godfather II has a fantastic depiction of the entire Corleone family fleeing from Havana as Guevara and Castro's troops march into those cities to liberate them from American control. Um, okay, so, or, or Batista's control, which was backed up by the United States. All right, so let's move on to the next aspect, which is rural guerrilla warfare. When Fidel Castro's forces won the war in Cuba, he institutionalized the guerrilla struggle. Important veterans of the Sierra Maestra movement became government officials. Most uh, significantly, Che Guevara, who I've already mentioned, became the treasurer, the secretary of the treasury. They continued to wear their guerrilla khakis, their boots, they didn't cut their beards, and the guerrilla war was celebrated as the most important part of the Cuban Revolution. Che Guevara published a book called Guerrilla Warfare, which turned the Cuban Revolt into something of a crusade. Guerrilla Warfare was a book which was you know, dog-eared paperback, which could be found in the knapsack of any revolutionary all across Latin America. It was hugely inspirational and was basically a how-to um, about how to conduct a successful guerrilla warfare and to win the support of the people and to overturn the dictatorial regime. Guerrilla warfare became widely influential in Latin America, but it also conveniently ignored the role that urban insurgents had won in the Cuban Revolution. Remember, the reason that the revolutionaries had been successful in Cuba, the, the rural guerrillas had been successful in Cuba, was because, at least in part, Batista was busy fighting the urban insurrections, allowing the rural movements to gain traction and to gain numbers. Now, guerrilla warfare, the term itself comes from the little wars, the guerrillas, war waged against Napoleon and Spain in the early 19th century. And Cuba had experienced guerrilla warfare before, during its independence struggles in the late 19th century. Mexico had also experienced guerrilla warfare 
during its revolution. And the United States had already encountered guerrilla warfare in Nicaragua from 1927 to 1933 when Agostino Cesar Sandino had resisted the U.S. Marines from the countryside using the landscape against the American invaders. But by the 1960s, rural guerrilla warfare had become the preferred method of insurrection across Latin America as people were increasingly inspired by the example of the Cuban Revolution. And the guerrilla war, warfare had a real spokesman in the figure of the charismatic uh, Che Guevara, who published this guerrilla warfare book in 1960. Now, Che Guevara, who was you know, considered the great expert on guerrilla warfare, made three axioms. A, a popular army can win the war. So what does that mean? If you invade a country and you have the support of the people, you will inevitably win the war because the insurrection itself creates the conditions for revolution. As the people win the hearts, uh, sorry, as the invading guerrilla war warriors win the hearts of the people, um, they will see that the government that is trying to repress the, the guerrilla warriors will use any means at their disposal to, to repress them, right? As a result, they see the brutality of the regime and the insurrection itself creates the conditions for the revolution. The other important aspect from um, guerrilla warfare that inspired Latin Americans was that they believed that the countryside was by far the best place for fighting. And in fact, guerrilla warfare almost it, it included something akin to instructions for a guerrilla uprising. A small force, referred to as a foco by Che Guevara in guerrilla warfare, operates in the countrysides, make, you know, troubling the regime, attacking the regimes, picking at the regimes, and making the oligarchic regimes of Latin America reveal their true, brutal, face as they drove the people into the arms of the revolutionaries by visiting violence upon the whole pot, the, the whole countryside that supports the um, guerrilla warfare. Constitutional governments would become repressive dictatorships as they tried to put out the flame of insurrection. So this is the most important part, that a popular army can win the war, that by waging war in the countryside, the government, the government reveals its dictatorial reality by trying to violently put down the popular, um, the popular revolt. What does Che Guevara believe this, this happens as a result? The revolt becomes even more popular because it exposes the brutality of the state that is trying to put down the insurrection, right? As a result, there are rural insurrections inspired by the Cuban Revolution all across Latin America in the years following Castro's successful overthrow of, of Batista. In Guatemala, guerrillas helped overthrow the repressive U.S.-backed dictatorship of Isidora Fuentes, but their challenge was met by both peasant indifference and troops trained and equipped by the United States. Um... See, the United States had been taken by surprise in the case of Cuba, so really they had not been able to train a force that was sufficient at resisting it. By the time war and rural insurrection came to, for instance, Guatemala, now the people who were trying to, um, over, to overthrow the government met resistance by officers trained at the School of the Americas to put down guerrilla fighting all across Latin America. And Guatemala in particular saw terrible violence as leftist regimes fought against rightist military coups, that, rightist military um, forces which were supported by the United States. Terrible violence came to Guatemala. About 150,000 people left Guatemala for Mexico or the United States by the mid 1980s, and about 150,000 more people were killed by the 1990s. In Venezuela, guerrillas sought to overthrow a popularly elected president, Ramalu Betancourt, but they did not succeed. In Colombia, the violence, la violencia, actually antedated the Cuban Revolution by about 10 years and was a continuation of the long legacy of rural warfare between liberals and conservatives in that country. But the violence between the um, rural 
folks and, and, and the uh, regime in Colombia was energized by the Cuban Revolution and a couple of new important liberating armies emerged. The Ejército de Liberación Nacional emerged in Colombia in 1964 and then several other guerrilla groups emerged following the example of Che Guevara and Fidel Castro waging war in the countryside and continually troubling the peace of Colombia and the... Um, the government of Cuba. The most successful was the Fuerzas Armadas Revolucionarias Colombianas, or the FARC, as it's more commonly known. And that was a, a rural insurrectionary movement supported and founded by the Communist Party in 1964. The Colombian military was never fully successful at putting down the guerrillas, and by the late 1990s, the ELN and the FARC had become serious threats to the survival of the government. To this day, Colombians still hold the FARC accountable for a great deal of violence and death visited upon Colombian people in the second half of the 20th century. However, all of these rural insurrections, were none of them were successful at overthrowing the government. The, only, the next successful rural revolution to come to Latin America is Nicaragua in the late 1970s, when the Sandinistas are finally successful in overthrowing the, the government of the corrupt Somoza regime. Why is it that Cuba is the only country to spawn a successful revolutionary movement? Well, for one thing, these revolutionary movements based in the countryside that had followed the example of Cuba, they lost the element of surprise. They lacked urban support, right? Um, they faced counterinsurgents insurgency trained by the United States and by the late 1960s many of these American officers had had experience fighting in the war in Vietnam they could now train um, Latin American officers in counter insurrection and ways to put down guerrilla warfare based upon their long experience um, fighting guerrillas in Vietnam perhaps the best example we can turn to to see why it is that rural revolutions in the wake of the Cuban Revolution were less successful, we can turn to Bolivia. Now Che Guevara ultimately left Cuba disillusioned by the bureaucratic work of being the Secretary of Treasury and Castro supported him as he went around the world to try and seed communist revolutions in the countryside of places all over the world. Che Guevara was also outspoken in his criticism of the USSR and Cuba's dependency upon that country, so Castro was probably happy to see him leave. Um, che Guevara, first he goes to Africa, but then later he turns up in Bolivia. And after seeing so many of these revolutionary movements kind of flounder in the early 1960s, Che Guevara hopes to reinvigorate Latin America's revolutionary movements by helping the Bolivian the Bolivians succeed in their revolution to overthrow the government. Castro and Che Guevara hoped to start fires all over Latin America, inspiring revolutionary movements, which would ultimately stretch America's military and repressive capability to the breaking point and create Vietnams all across Latin America. So Che Guevara went to Bolivia but ultimately failed. Now this was partially because Bolivia was just a bad choice. The United States was very determined to stop more revolutionaries by this point. Um, che Guevara had a very small force, which never really won the support of the Bolivian people. And remember, that is the first axiom of guerrilla warfare. You will not be successful unless you win the support of the people. Another problem in Bolivia was that Frankly, the causes of rural insurrection, the fact that rural peasants had lost their land, that wasn't the case in Bolivia. Bolivia had actually experienced a revolution in 1952 where there had been significant land redistribution in Bolivia. And the president of Bolivia, René Barrientos, was actually pretty popular. He even spoke Quechua, which was the most, most widely spoken native language in Bolivia. So ignoring his own advice from guerrilla warfare, Che Guevara put his FOCO, the small military invading force, and based its operations out of easily accessible river valleys in Bolivia. Che and his men had learned Quechua because they wanted to indoctrinate the peasants and get them to join the cause, but actually where they landed and where they based their operations, Quechua wasn't spoken, Guarani was, and none of Che Guevara's men could speak this language, so they looked like outsiders. The FOCO was a Cuban operation, and when the Bolivian government said that, 
oh, you know, this is a foreign invasion, there was some truth to the matter. By September of 1967, Che Guevara and his foco in Bolivia, their fortunes were flagging, and they realized that they were fighting troops who were trained in the School of the America, trained by U.S. Marines. Che Guevara was captured on October of 8th, and executed the next day by Bolivian military personnel under the watchful eye of the Americans. Che Guevara's death led to a re-examination of the whole focal thesis and the whole emphasis on rural insurrection across Latin America. After his death in 1967, there were few new rural insurrections that began across Latin America. And it would only be in 1979 when the next rural-based insurrection would succeed, the Sandinistas operating in Nicaragua. El Salvador also witnessed a rekindling of rural warfare, but in Sendera Luminosa in Peru also began a major rural-based insurrection. But these new movements in El Salvador and in Peru had learned from Che's mistake. For instance, Shining Path in Peru assiduously cultivated indigenous nationalism and built a broad base of support amongst Peruvian peasants. So if you don't win the support of the people, your guerrilla war will not be successful. But there was another problem with the thesis promulgated by Cadet Castro and Guevara that it was only the rural insurrection that could that that mattered. The fact of the matter was that in Cuba the reason that the rural insurrection succeeded was because the urban insurrection had been busy tying down Batista's men, allowing this rural-based foco led by Castro and Guevara to succeed. By the late 1970s, it was clear that rural insurrection was perhaps not the best way to achieve revolutionary goals, and we see a burgeoning of urban insurrectionary movements start to develop across Latin America. In Uruguay, for instance, we see the emergence of the Tupamaros, who took from the rich and gave to the poor, but in an urban setting, they robbed banks kidnapped ambassadors, and the government came down increasingly hard on these rebels, and the violence increased as the government-sponsored paramilitary death squads who went out to try and crush the Tupamaro revolt. The problem with the Tupamaros, and we're going to see this again and again with urban insurrections, is that it scared people. You know, bombings, robberies, kidnappings, just ordinary run-of-the-mill people didn't like living amongst that violence. And as the struggle became more bloody, the Tupamaros actually lost most of their support. Chile and Brazil also witnessed a surge in urban warfare in the 1970s, but perhaps it was Argentina where urban warfare was the most prevalent. Now, what had happened in Argentina was that after the exodus of, after the exile of Perón, in the 1950s, Buenos Aires had been ruled by a military coup. And insurrection following the Cuban, mo- the Cuban movement had broken out in Argentina. All of the violence as you know, these urban guerrillas kidnapped foreign businessmen, did robberies, hijackings, exposed the weakness of the government and the insecurity and the fear engendered in the Argentine people by the increased violence brought on by these revolutionaries did ultimately lead to a collapse of the government. And lo and behold, in 1973, Juan Perón returned from exile to become the president of Argentina again. That is what the guerrillas had wanted. The Montoneros in Argentina had hoped that Perón would return to power in Argentina and remove uh, and, and, and take power back from the military. And he did return in 1973, but in fact, Perón was not far enough to the left for these new Argentine guerrillas who looked to socialism, Che Guevara, and Fidel Castro for inspiration. So when Perón returned, he didn't go far away to the, far enough to the left didn't help matters that he quickly died and his wife took over as the presidency. And, you know, prior to the return of Perón, the guerrillas, the urban guerrillas carrying out this violence, had largely been in tune with the masses and had re- received popular support. But after Perón returned, they increasingly represented a fringe element and they had a very difficult time cultivating support. 
Nevertheless, as the government stepped up its repression of the guerrilla movements in Argentina, the guerrillas also stepped up their kidnappings and robberies. Now, they dispersed much of their spoils to the poor in an effort to build popular support, but the government used terror to support the, to separate them from their potential supporters. The urban guerrillas represented a newer, more mature approach to guerrilla warfare, but in fact, the violence that the Montoneros continued to use to um, discredit the regime in Argentina resulted in their increasing isolation. People in Argentina were tired of the violence. They were tired of these guerrillas who were trying to remove people from power through violence. And ultimately, when the military inevitably returned to power in Argentina, this military, supported in no small part by the United States and rightist military dictatorships, which were emerging all across Latin America, they wanted to bring back order. The, the unfortunate side effect of all of these revolutionary movements across Latin America in the 1960s and the 1970s, revolutionary movements inspired by Che Guevara, inspired by Fidel Castro, is that they increased violence in their countries, right? The repression of these revolutionaries increased the violence and the revolutionaries would step up their revolutionary activities, bringing even more violence. And as a result, just normal, everyday, run-of-the-mill, middle-class or working-class people feared that, you know, going to work, they would, be caught, they, they would be caught up and killed in a robbery gone wrong or an assassination attempt or a kidnapping. You know, what did they want? They kind of wanted peace. They wanted order to return. And as a result, all across Latin America, military dictatorships took over, right? Argentina as well. And once this military dictatorship took over in Argentina, they waged a dirty war, a secret war against the revolutionaries, disappearing all sorts of people who supported the revolutionary movements. These dirty wars to repress these revolutionary movements had more popular support than you might have expected. Why? Because after a period of sustained revolutionary movements across Latin America inspired by the Cuban Revolution, by the late 1970s, most Latin Americans wanted peace. So, in summary, the Cuban example was very significant all across Latin America and inspired thousands of Latin Americans to join revolution, revolutionary movements, and many of them to die in those revolutionary movements. But the Cold War context raised the stakes. The United States, in trying to vanquish communism from the world and its, and its, and its Cold War against Russia and its ideological counterpart, communism, thought that the stakes were too high to allow these revolutionary movements to flourish. As a result, they funded all sorts of military campaigns aimed at quashing the revolutionary movements and increasing the violence all across Latin America as a result. By the 1970s, rural insurrection was no longer possible in Latin America. Rural insurrection, guerrillas inspired by the example of Che Guevara and Fidel Castro, increasingly saw that whenever they went into war, they would be going against counter-revolutionaries trained in the United States. Nicaragua, which would actually be the next successful revolution beginning in 1979, in the 1980s, after the success of that revolution, they, were, they would have to fight against Contras, Contra revolutionaries, Contra Sandinistas, who were trained by the United States, many of them at the School of the Americas, to put down revolutionary activity. As a result of this increased revolutionary activity in Latin America, we see the rise of dictatorships all across Latin America in the 1970s and the 1980s because these military dictatorships promised to restore peace, to end the revolutionary movements so that Latin Americans could once again live lives free of the threat of violence. Of course, in their pursuit of this social order, the Latin American dictatorships committed their own violent acts, monstrous violent acts, disappearing young people and anyone accused of any sort of kind of revolutionary activity. Monstrous and unimaginable.